the concept of blending is, is, is not, not unfamiliar to you. Uh, a, a wine such as, as Moen Chandon's uh, you know, vintage is going to be blended from across the entire region. But at the same time, you know, I think that a lot of people, you know, a lot of people ask me, well, if terroir is so important, you know, if terroir is so important in Champagne, doesn't the idea of a blend erase that? Yeah? Uh, doesn't the idea that these wines are blended somehow decrease the importance of terroir? I think no, actually. I think that, that uh, even when you're blending dozens or hundreds of wines together, the, the quality and character of each wine is important. Right? You, in order to make a good blend, you have to have good components. I think it's very much like an orchestra, right? Like uh, in an orchestra, you need the strings and you need the oboes and you need that guy with the French horn. And uh, you know, they, they, they all, they come together to, to make a single entity, but, but they're, they're all doing different things, right? And so by the same token, like if, you know, if, if you have an orchestra of really excellent musicians, then, uh, then you're producing something that's, that's really fantastic. If your second violins are out of tune, or you know, if like your timpanist can't stay on time, then it's going to decrease the, the, the quality of the performance, right? And so I think that, that this is very much you know, the same thing that, that's going on in, in blended champagne. And so you know, we tend to think that you know, when, when, when we talk about terroir and champagne, we tend to focus on grower estates. You know, we, um, you know, we think that, that it's, it's really uh, you know, these, these small artisanal guys that are, that, that are exploring this issue. But in fact, uh, classic negociants are just as much on board with, uh, you know, with, with this exploration of, of champagne's terroir today um, you know, than as, as anybody else. Um, when you know when when you visit the the best negociants in Champagne, you see that that they're vinifying. A lot of them are are, are vinifying um, you know parcels separately. They're they're keeping things uh, um, you know they're keeping individual wines separate all the way until blending to have as as, as large a palette uh, you know to to blend from as possible. They are for for the wines that that, that they're growing themselves. I mean, like for example, you know Moet and Chandon. Or let's say LVMH, the largest vineyard holders, you know, in, in the Champagne region, and so they have they have a vast collection of, of, of very well situated vineyards, and um, and they're exploring you know ideas of, of viticulture and and you know experimenting in the vines just as much as as you know anybody else. So so you know when when we talk about contemporary Champagne and, and you know talk about uh, talk about you know, issues of terroir and, and, and vineyards and viticulture. I think it's really important to remember that it's not just grower estates. You know? It's, it's, um, and for, for this reason, I, I very rarely talk about champagne in terms of growers and houses. I think that it's, that's, that's a, a, a really handy marketing tool if, you know, if you, you're selling grower champagne, but, um, um, and you know, I've, been, I've certainly you know, used that in the past too, um, but but I think today champagne is complex enough where um, you know I mean it might sound simplistic, but it's but I I really tend to think of of the contrast being good producers, quality producers, conscientious producers versus those that aren't. And and they can be you know it can be a two hectare grower estate, or you know it can be you know a five million bottle a year negociant. But yeah, I, I do think that it's important to remember that that you know this that these ideas are are across the entire appellation. We were talking before about uh, you know oxidative and reductive champagne. Um, with Moet and Chandon, the style. Is is very very deliberately reductive. They, they they and historically it's it's always been that way. 
um, you know, their, their winemakers are, are looking to make a wine of longevity and, and um, using reduction as a tool to, um, uh, you know, to enhance that, basically. So you know, Moet always has a very distinct nose. Yeah, it's this, uh, um, it's this like toasty, smoky, uh, you know, and it's not for everybody. Uh, you know, some people are really put off by it, but um, but that's very much a part of the style. And um, and I think you know, I think you know this this wine expresses the Moet, the Moet Chenon style very well. I mean, the vintages are different, but. I think it's a nice contrast with the Veuve Clicquot, you know, the, the second wine. Um, I mean, 2006 was a more kind of broader, rounder vintage. Um, you know, 2008 is, is um, much more structured and you know, much more uh, um, kind of concentrated. But I think here you can really see the, the contrasting styles of these houses. You know, Moet is, is looking for for this relatively lean, uh, you know, very reductive style of, of champagne. Veuve Clicquot, especially in the vintage wine, is, is looking for richness and, um, and really kind of expressing the, the power and the concentration of Pinot Noir. Oh, it is a vintage that I like very much. Um, there are these vintages, you know, these rare vintages in champagne where where you have both high ripeness and high acidity, which is weird, right? Because like, as ripeness goes up, acidity should be going down. Um, 96, famously, was, was the first of, of these in, in the modern era. Nobody had, had seen a vintage like this, and so they didn't really know what to do with it. But I think that the Champagne I really learned since, since 96. Uh, you know, I mean, there are good 96s, but there are also a lot of 96s where the acidity is, is too dominant. And, and um, you know, these wines, the, the fruit is never going to, you know, is, is, is never going to, to, you know, live as long as, as the acidity. Um, uh, 2008, I feel, is a vintage that's very much in that mold. It's sort of like what 96 could have been, you know. Um, or, you know, or a vintage where you see that people learned their lessons from 96 and, and maybe you know, picked a little bit later and picked a little riper. But so it's, it's a vintage that has very concentrated fruit, but as you can see here, like the, has very concentrated structure as, as well. And I think that, that this vintage is going to age fabulously well. Going back to 2006 and Le Brun um, So the first wine that we had from Le Brun was, uh, was pure Chardonnay. Uh, this, their, their prestige cuvee, um, they blend a little bit of, of uh, Pinot Noir and, and Meunier in. But I think that, actually, to go back, one of the things that I forgot to say about that both Clicquot was that uh, Clicquot Boozy has always been a very important village for, for Clicquot. Obviously, this wine is not pure boozy or anything like that. Um, but I think that that aesthetic, that kind of, that booziness of, you know, like roundness, richness, powerful Pinot, I think that's very evident in that, you know, in, in that wine. And by the same token, with this Le Brun uh, you know, when, when we tasted that Blanc de Blanc in, in the first flight, you see that, that, uh, that kind of power and richness of, of Avis and Cremant. You know? And I think the same thing is going on in, in this wine, even though the varietal composition is a little bit different, but, uh, but that aesthetic remains. You know? And, and in, in that sense, I think it really reflects its terroir. So one area that we haven't really talked about, here's the city of Epernay. And so this is the Cote de Blanc here. Uh, this, is, this is the Valais de la Marne or you know, what we think of as, as the Valley of the Marne, like really goes this way. There's this section down here. And so when, when, you, um, you know, when you look at atlases or when you look at wine books, uh, this part is, this, this area is, is considered to be part of the Valley de la Marne. But for me, I, I've always had a little problem with that. Um, I, I think that it's, 
even though the area is quite small, I think that it's, it's distinct enough that it deserves to be treated on its own. Um, in in the, the Champagne region, it's, it's, this area is called the Coteau Sud d'Epernay. So, you know, like the area south of Epernay, the hills south of Epernay. And um, here, where the Valley de la Marne is really on this very heavy, this very deep clay, uh, here in the Coteau Sud, the terroir is extremely mixed. Um, you have areas of limestone, you have areas that are very chalky. Uh, there is a, I'm sure, uh, you know, a lot of you know um, La Hert Frere, who is in the village of Chavot. Um, I mean, Aurelien La Hert, uh, he identifies something like 20 different terroirs in, in his village alone. So it's, you know, it, it's this, this area of, of incredible diversity. But so, um, yeah, there are these villages there with names like Pierre, uh, Moussy, um, Chavot. Yeah. Uh, but so the fourth line in this flight is, is um, from Bruno Gobiard. And a lot of this wine comes from, comes from this area, yeah, the, the Coteau Sud. I think because, because of this diversity of terroir, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to describe a Coteau Sud character. But at the same time, you know it when you taste it. It's uh, a lot of times, you know, people, people in, the, in this area will point out that they, they combine, you know, it makes sense because of their location, right? They combine the chalkiness of, of the Cote de Blanc with the body of, of the Valley de la Marne. So the wines are heavier than those of the Cote de Blanc, but lighter than, than uh, those of the Marne Valley. And, you know, I mean, that could be true. Um, I think that, that uh, you feel that a little bit in, in this wine. But uh, so, as, as its name as its name indicates, uh, you know it, it's it's made from from his oldest vines, um, and uh, yeah, and this I think you know this is this is a wine that I like very much.